Hi folks, I'm Sylvie with the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition and I'm going to talk to you about bike fitting today. I do want to kick this off though with an amazing video with um, Olympic medalist Nelson Vales. Maybe you know him, he's kind of a big deal and he lives in San Diego. So Nelson teamed up with us because bike fitting is an amazing Thing for any cyclist to know, even if you only plan to do a couple miles of biking at a time, having a bike that fits you and feels good is so essential. So Nelson definitely knows all about that, but he's going to talk about some of the additional things beyond just bike fitting that any cyclist might want to uh, keep in mind. And again, if you plan to bike five miles, 10 miles, 80 miles, this is going to be useful and applicable to all of that. So let me toss up this amazing video that Nelson gave me. And he's a busy guy. He couldn't join us tonight. Hello, my name is Stuart Tomp with CV Sciences, and I'm here today with my very good friend, Nelson Vales. Hello, Nelson. Hello, my name is Nelson Vales, Olympic and World Cycling Champion. You may remember me from the 1984 Olympics as the New York City Bicycle Messenger. And I'm happy to be here today at CV Science. Nelson, it's so great to have you here today, and we have some uh, questions for you. We want to learn a little bit more about what it's like to be you, and more importantly, let's talk about the pre-ride preparation. You know, Stuart, that's, that's a good question. The pre-ride preparation, always ask me this question. Uh, everyone is individually different, and we all know that, and our listeners will too, and here's a good example. Um, if the event starts at seven, per se. Hypothetically, the event starts at seven. Some people may need to get up at four in the morning just to have coffee, uh, relax, eat a little light something as they pack their bags and get the car ready for travel or to meet a group. Some people can do it an hour before with no breakfast. But the preparation is to use your routine as you would if you're going to work. So coffee, restroom, get ready, hair, makeup, and then go out the door on an on-time manner. So before we get into the news that you can use, the tricks and the tips, mm -hmm. do you also visualize yourself, Nelson, crossing the finish line? Is there part of the visualization you seeing yourself? You know, that's another good question. And it is true that I, I would like to say we all are dreamers. And I do. When I do my preparation to get ready for an event, I like to see myself as what it's going to be like at the finish line. What am I going to do? You know, is the camera's going to be there? Will I get my shot that, you know, that you could put on the refrigerator because you're doing these marathons and these cycling events and you have the professional photographers on hand and you get these mail order pictures and stuff like that of the event. So those things run through my head on, am I going to put the fist up or the hands up? How am I going to cross the line? Uh, things like that. But those are the enjoyment of the preparation just to get to the finish. So to stay and to get into that Zen state, do you mess with the bicycle the night before? Interesting. That is a big no-no. If you've ridden your bike the day before or even two days before and haven't touched it the day before the event, the bike is fine. If you pumped up your tires and had everything ready to go, there's no adjustments to the chain, to seat, put new handlebar tape. If you haven't done that for the pre-ride, test ride, then you don't touch your bike. A good example again, Stuart, you don't touch your car before you get in and drive to go to work the day before or the morning of, you know, you're not going to raise the hood up and start tinkering around in the engine. Same concept with your bicycle. And another expert tip that you were giving me before we recorded today, you were telling me that in the morning, it's really critical to get up early enough to have really healthy bodily movements so that you can spend all of your energy out on the cycle. That's true. And that's what I was trying to say it in a kind of way of you wake up and have your coffee and take your time to get yourself ready which you know, uh, our viewers should know this, and then you start your routine as if you are going to work. So you, you have your breakfast, you use the restroom, you get ready, and then you head out the door. You were saying don't come downstairs manner. dressed up? Oh, that was another thing. That's just another thing. For anyone that's doing an event, and if you're staying at a hotel or a dormitory, wherever you are, an elite cyclist never comes downstairs to breakfast dressed to ride. You come down in your sweats or whatever you wear to breakfast, you eat, enjoy your breakfast in a timely manner. You go back upstairs to get ready, use the restroom, you get dressed, you put on your sunscreen or whatever you need to do. So when you come down to the car, team bus, or meet the group in the lobby, you're ready to go. And there's no last minute, I need to fill my water bottle, I need to do this, 
all that stuff should have been done pretty much the night before in the morning of of waking up on time and taking your time and having the time that's taking your time in the morning of waking up on time <laughs> okay so let's talk about the morning of do you stretch of. do you breakfast all of the above stretching is so important to anyone uh me being of age and retired cyclist is so much more important. I think most of the adults can relate that's watching this now. You know, I get on my yoga mat and I do my little calisthenic stretches and something is better than nothing. Some people need to do a full calisthenic workout. Some people don't stretch as often, like myself, but you get to just stretch and crack that back and, and move those arms and legs around. And those are some of the points I like to make of you got to do something is better than nothing as preparation to get ready. Breakfast? No breakfast. The day breakfast, arrived. again, each individual is different. Um, me, I prefer a full breakfast if I have the time, uh, depending on the ride distance. So, a good example for our listeners. I'll go out for a 50 mile ride. Yes, I'll have uh, probably a scrambled egg and some toast, mm -hmm. some jelly, that's a little sugar. I'll enjoy my coffee and then I'll get ready, but then I'll bring an energy, bell, uh, energy gel and probably an energy bar with me on the ride, just in case. And the CBD, is it working its way into the early sort of morning part of the... That's something that you didn't bring up. Those are some of the vitamins. See, I take medication in the morning and the evening uh, from my past history of life, but um, we'll get into that another time. But yes, I do my one a days in the evening and I do my one a days in the morning and everyone has their preference on what's gonna get their engine started. Now, in terms of hydration, you were sharing a little expert tip that I thought the audience would love about drinking water instead of sipping water, which is you know, paradoxical. That's, I'm so happy we got a chance to talk about this personally and now we can share this with our viewers. Many people don't know that they watch the Tour de France or any bike race on TV and they see the guys throwing their water bottles out, throwing their water wondering. bottles out. You know, it's because those bottles are empty and they go get another one because to prevent dehydration and cramping, you have to drink your water, not sip your water. So if you're going to ride 20 miles and you did not drink that full water bottle, you stand a risk of dehydration. I don't care how good you are. Some people ride further on one bottle. Some people don't. But for me personally and my expertise of know-how, you need to drink that one water bottle within that 20-mile radius in order to, preventive, to, to start the preventive measures for when you finish. But if you're just sipping, you might get, you might get cramps on be known to yourself. Well, a good, a good example about sipping, it's like taking short breaths. Eventually, you're not going to get enough. So if you sip your water and now you want to drink it, it's already too late. How's that? So you need to drink your water, empty it out. You can always put a foot down and get another one. The nice thing about it as well is that you can put in a better effort if you are drinking your water. All right, let's sipping. break it down by the day. How, many, how often do you train? Uh, me, personally... I ride six days a week, 10 to 50 miles in a pop. And the reason why I put that range in on my weekends, I'll ride a little longer. And lately with pandemic, I've been doing a lot of not, uh, social distancing solo rides. Mm. So when you're doing a group ride, you can go a lot further, a lot more camaraderie. But me, I limit myself within my ability to be productive at the end of the day. So for someone that's just starting out or 10 mile ride, 15 mile ride, these are my little loops that I set goals for myself, goals, commitments. You make your bed, you make your coffee. You make your coffee, you should make your bed. Things like that. So um, I'm gonna do the 10 mile loop today, I'm gonna do the 20 mile loop. I don't have to do the 10 mile loop at 25 miles an hour, I can do the 10 mile loop at 14 miles an hour. You do the 20 mile loop at 16 miles an hour, within your limits. You don't have to do a Strava racing time in order to put in the distance. So one big thing for our listeners, and remember this, Stuart, you don't do the miles. You let the miles come to you. Wow. The miles come to you. So what's the yeah. biggest mistake other than that? Um, nutrition. The biggest mistake is nutrition. Uh, the water, the intake before, during, and after. Uh, people will not follow the proper nutrition or taking even a rest break. During the rides, these group rides, mm. some people rather not stop when it's okay to stop. The clock is ticking, but your life is not. You know, things like that. So you could stop, put a foot down, rehydrate, eat that candy bar, whether you're hungry or not, because when you want to eat it, it's already too late. Again, you run into 
to the inner self of it already being too late. And that's where the bunk comes in. That's where you're tired and worn out at the end of the day of your ride and you can't uh, be productive. So what about people that want to learn about road cycling? What's the best way for somebody mm. new? I'm new to this. I'm now interested and inspired because of you. You know, my go-to place, my real true go-to place, I always look up the, the San Diego Bike Coalition because their website and drop-down menus has all types of information, mm -hmm. uh, bike shops, things like that for those. I have my own mechanics, of course, at this level. But I'll look up some rides and some events on what's maybe coming up that I can do recreationally, mm -hmm. uh, what events I can appear at as far as just to go see. And these are things that uh, my family and I would go do. Hey, let's go do this event. They're having a cycling dinner thing or something. But the San Diego Bike Coalition's website has all that information. What's your favorite ride here in San Diego? Uh, for me, myself personally, I like to tell all our listeners and viewers, you know, you map out that plan from your driveway. So from my driveway, uh, I'm up in the Rancho Forest Ranch, Penasquitos area, so I ride around Black Mountain, the Rancho Penasquitos mm. Bike 56 bike path, uh, Rancho Santa Fe, climb back up towards the uh, Rancho Bernardo Road area, and those are my little 10, 20, 30 mile loops that will take me in, a, in some sort of key shape form and not just an out and back, but a little bit more scenery to it. So you mentioned the San Diego Bike Coalition. Is this the best place for cyclists to get help with their bicycle, I think any other? For beginner cyclists, that's the best go-to place to get a start. Um, of course, everyone asks Google, but Google has so many drop-downs that you click on the wrong thing or it takes you somewhere where you really don't want to be. So safe place at home is local. It has local information, uh, local shops, local group rides, local how-to, everything is all right there. Okay, you're done riding. Let's walk through the recovery period, you come back post-ride recovery. Post-ride recovery, after my shower, uh, I've been using the CBD products. So with my Plus CBD products, I like to use my roll-on, that's my favorite go-to. Uh, and I do that right around the Where calf Where do you use area. that, the shoulder? The calf area, uh, around the thighs, around the thighs, uh, along my shoulder. But then again, for my shoulder and my wrist, I use the balm. So I have my little tricks that I so like to use. So let's talk about that for a second. You mm -hmm. like the roll-on for the knees and for the calf? Yes, I roll the, it on in those areas. Here. And the balm is a, you, a little bit on your fingers, and then you just roll it in that little touch saw point. You were telling me that the hands, the, the analyst, is constantly gripping, and if they're losing feeling in their hands, that's because you're either sitting incorrectly or you're holding on too tightly. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, a lot of people that may have hand trouble, like their hands get numb, a lot of times their position is off in a minute angle, a mm -hmm. centimeter here or there, and a local bike shop, the bike coalition can help you with that to get your position correct for mm -hmm. the back and neck knees to talk to each other. Um, but with the hands, uh, not only do I use the balm around my wrist area, but then we also have the lotion, but we won't get into that yet. But the balm is one of my favorites, and I use that on my shoulder and right around my hand wrist area. And this is all post-ride things, and the fun thing about this too, you got to laugh. You know, I take my shower and I'll put on this stuff with my lotion and beautify, manscape myself. I'll use it that way, right? And then I'll put on some sweats to go relax, maybe flip channels or prepare lunch. But then you forget that the achy points that you put the, the balm or the, or the roll on is not there. And you forgot that they were sore. And that's the funny, I laugh at myself sometimes because you were I'm doing me. all these things and I was sore before I started, but then I put the, the ointment on and then I start doing all these things and I forget all about it. I'm already on to the next day. Because you were telling me the ultimate goal, if you're going to enjoy this, is to be able to come back from the ride and to be able to have energy to do something else. And that's, that's one of the right? things that the recreational or the beginner makes a mistake. Uh, an example is uh, he or she has an hour to do some exercise, a bicycle ride. So they try to go out and do 25 miles in an hour, this big loop, with, uh, that's not in your range. So it's okay to go out for 10 miles, 15 miles within that hour, which is a good riding pace. Um, mm -hmm. Some people like to ride at 20 miles an hour, but I'm just saying recreational, 15, 17 miles an hour recreational pace, that's your loop, that's what you do. You can come home and be productive and not tired versus if you try to do 25 miles in an hour, you're gonna come home, be non-productive, you wanna eat everything in the refrigerator, 
you're sore and tired. So since we were fortunate enough to meet you, and we've encouraged you to try our Plus CBD products, have you noticed a before and after that you're willing to share with everybody? You know, it's funny because I asked, I use the stuff, but I asked, what is CBD? <laughs> You, you, you know, I'm use, you, you, you provided the stuff and then gave me some pointers, and I've been using it, and now we got a chance to sit and talk. Mm -hmm. And I, can you just explain a little bit more of what I'm doing? Yes, I can. I, I can. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for trusting us. Yes. CBD is simply a molecule in hemp, and it supports every cell in your body to help with stress, sleep, and comfort. Interesting. So the gel tabs I take at night with my medication, that's helping my relaxation to sleep. Yes. Interesting. It's helping Interesting. to balance your circadian rhythm. Okay. And you're helping to repair more effectively. What's that word again? What'd you just say? Circadian rhythm. So circadian. your 24 hour cycle. Okay. Because the CBD speaks to every cell in your body and it helps deal with stress, sleep, and comfort. Interesting. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And now that's put, now that you said it that way, it puts two and two together for when I use the samples you provided and how it's working and I don't know it's working because it's already done its job. And that's one of the reasons I yeah. couldn't wait to work with you because I figured you would know. You'll know if your knee hurts less. Yes. I don't have to explain, no one yeah. has to sell you on it. I want to interrupt you real quick. You sent me some samples. I sent a lotion to a friend of mine in Texas, Alan, and he has bad hands as well. We're all of age. And he said he started using a 200 milligram lotion on his hands daily and he's moving freely now. So I don't know whether it's an arthritic thing or something like that, but again, it was an oh wow, aha moment of, hey, I'm using this, try it out, and I didn't explain anything, I just said, use the lotion. And so whether sure it's enough, topically for the cream or the balm, or the roll on that you're using mm -hmm. for your knees, or even the soft gel that you take, it speaks to every cell in your body. Interesting. And it's got one goal, homeostasis, balance, repair. I like Isn't that word. Beautiful? Homeostasis? Yeah. Homeostasis. And if you're, if you're as busy as you are as a cyclist, it would stand to reason that you would want to have a more appropriate stress response. Well, get this. Here's a good, I have a question for you. I'm about to do a four hour flight uh, uh, south. I have to do a big long flight, and so we're gonna be sitting in the seat for a while. Um, is there any helpful tips on how should I use any of these products for a plane ride? Well, I can tell you what I do. Okay, thank you. Because I travel all the time. Uh -huh. I'll take more than just one of those gold soft gels. I'll take two or three sometimes, okay. especially for a long flight. I wanted to ask about that, but I wasn't sure if I should, then I'm answering my question with a question. And, so, and, and I, used, I put it on my knees uh -huh. and on my back. Yes, the lower so, back for sure. So that while I'm sitting on the plane, You've got great circulation, you're not We're going to do this. We're going to nice do this. Nice and relaxed when you get there. I'll come back on mm -hmm. and, and speak with you, and mm -hmm. I'm going to try this on my first trip across the country and see what this is like. I, I'm really looking forward to that. The other thing I couldn't wait to tell you about was the um, rider's high. The when rider's you're riding high. your bike mm -hmm. and you feel high, naturally. Yes. You know the feeling I'm well, talking about. Well, that's the freedom. That's the, I like to call it the freedom of being outdoors. Right, but athletes you know I mean? have now identified this. Yes. The runner's what? high, the cyclist's high. And you know, it's, you bring that up and there was a word, we were talking, you brought up a word and I can't bring, it doesn't come to mind right now, but I'll come, it, it'll come to me. But you know, that feeling, that feeling of sensation, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's within an individual. So let's say finish line, we'll use a finish line, event finish line, that high you get from crossing the finish line, it's that self-achievement. You know, you're using that self-achievement because you have an elite person that's doing it at a different time, at a different level, and then you have you as a recreational homemaker, uh, father, son, daughter, that's doing it on a, on a not so elite level, but recreational, but that sense of accomplishment across the finish line, that's, the, that's what gets everyone, I guess, jazzed up because you did it yourself. Again, you make your bed, you have your coffee, you have these little self daily goals, and to get across the finish line at no matter what time you've done it in, you've done it. Well, the reason I brought it up is there is a connection between the CBD that you're taking and that runner's high. Interesting. There's a connection that the CBD that you're taking is actually influencing your body to be high on its own supply. Interesting. So Just that's 15 milligrams? That's, that's all it takes. 
That's all it takes. A very small amount. That's why I want. I, I wanted to talk to you about that rider's high. One of the things CBD does is it can enhance that sensibility in you and speak to every right. cell. Okay. Stress, sleep, and comfort. So the idea now that you've been on it for a while. You know something? Now, as you were speaking, I got to redesign my pill box, my daily pill box now. So now we're going to add another tablet, not only for the evening, but for the daytime. So, so I'm looking forward to this. And this is so exciting news for me. As a recreational cyclist, ex-professional cyclist that's been there, done that, I tell you what, the, it's, it feels so good to, to, what's the word I'm looking for, to accomplish what I've done in my past, but then to embrace this side of it now on a recreational side, just like a you and me kind of thing. Well, these are wellness products, and mm -hmm. you're a national treasure, Nelson. Thank you. And we want you and need you to be as healthy and as vibrant as possible to help share your love and your experience with millions of, of people. And we're so honored to know you and to share this ride with I'm you, I'm so Nelson. happy to share my information with you and all the listeners out there. And I've learned so much from just this meeting with us and how to pr appropriately use the products that you provided for me that I'm excited. And thank you for sharing these expert tips with everyone so they can more effectively enjoy uh, cycling and, and being present. And what did you say? That moment when you win your... What's your self-achievement? The self-achievement, right? self-achievement. And so maybe we could get a little bit of self-achievement in a bottle with plus CBD, help to enhance your it's endocannabinoid. It's not only maybe, but you will. How's that? You will have, because again, it's your self-accomplishment. It only starts by taking it. So that's your first step. And then realizing how it affects you. So take plus CBD and enjoy the ride. My name is Stuart Tomp signing off, and this is my great friend, Nelson Vales. Thank you. Whoa, that was an awesome video. That taught me a ton. And I'm hoping I can teach you all some new and exciting stuff too. So again, this is Bike Fitting 101. Welcome. We just saw a video with special guest and Olympic medalist Nelson Vales, and he was joined by CB Sciences plus CBD, talking about a lot of the stuff that I'll get to in some detail in this class. But, well, I'll just dive into it. Let's do this. Let's talk about bike fitting. So bike fitting is something that's valuable to any cyclist if you plan to bike five miles at a time, even less, or if you plan to bike 50 plus miles at a time. What I want to teach you today is about being bike lingo. Some of that stuff is going to make you feel confident in bike shops. I want to teach you how to make a bike fit your own unique body because bikes don't come in just one size fits all, as you know, but they also have a lot of adjustability. We'll also talk about saddles. That's a big one. I have plenty of anecdotes because I spent a lot of time in bike shops, a lot of time talking to people about saddle issues. And finally, we'll touch on a lot of the things that Nelson just spoke about, but ways to maximize comfort when you bike, because it's not all about the fit of the bike. Image because you'll see the is gonna move as we go. And this is some of the bike lingo that I hope you'll come away with at the end of the day, and you'll be able to confidently go into a bike shop and talk about these things. I think it's essential to be able to communicate what you need when it comes to getting a bike fit. So you don't just walk into a shop and say, my body doesn't feel good, but you can say this specifically doesn't feel good. This is the stuff I want to think about adjusting. So a little bit of a quiz, come on, do this along with me if you want, but this is what you should be able to label on a bike. And it's the things that I'll be talking about a lot as we make adjustments. So you've got the saddle. I think that's it. You've got the seat tube. This will come up when we talk about the size of the bike. Handlebars, that's a pretty easy one. Stem, this is gonna be an essential thing to know because stems come in a lot of shapes and sizes. They have a ton of adjustability. Top tube, also a key component that'll speak to the geometry of the bike. We've got the pedals. That's an obvious one to a lot of people, but you can have lots of styles of pedals. So we'll talk about that. We've also got the cranks. So that's the pedaling system, what you'd be, you know, cranking as you go along and move the bike. Those also come in a couple of lengths. So you have choice about those. And finally, the wheel. So wheel size can change. The wheel is everything. It's the tire, the tube, the spokes, the hub, the rim. All of that is just the wheel. 
So bike fitting lingo. This is some of the geometry stuff that you might want to know going into a bike shop as you explain some of the things you need, some of the things you want to change. So oftentimes when we talk about bike sizes with mountain bikes, they might talk about, you know, small, medium, large with road bikes. Usually we'll get a bit more specific about size. We'll talk about the size in centimeters, but what people always want to know when sizing you is what your standover height is. So we'll get to that in a second. We also have this distance called reach. So it is the distance between the middle of the bottom bracket. So that's the space that the frame connects, that the crank goes into. Um, and then that's kind of the extension out over to the stem. So that's gonna dictate how much bend you have in your back, how much bend you have in your elbows. All of those things have not adjusted well can lead to a lot of pain. And then the wheelbase is also something a little less about bike fit, but something I think people should know about because it's going to change how the bike feels. And when you look up, you know, a new bike that you want to buy online, this is some of the info that you might see kind of listed out. So it's good to know the wheelbase is. As an example, at the top, you can see a tandem. And on that tandem bike, it has this crazy long wheelbase. If anybody's been on a tandem bike, go ahead and tell me in the chat what it's like to bike on one of those it's amazing the difference between biking on a track bike that has a pretty small wheelbase and then biking on something like a tandem that feels like, you know, being on a boat because of the way it moves because you have so much space between the wheels. So this is the question. Does your bike fit your unique body? One of the things I've joked about lately with some folks is that uh, a woman is not a small man and also Bikes get designed for all kinds of different people, but sometimes you walk into a bike shop and someone's going to like look at you, kind of judge you and be like, this is the type of bike you want to be on. And for someone who's totally new to biking, sometimes you just have no idea what you want out of a bike, how you want to feel on it, how you want to use it, what kind of miles you want to do. So I had a job at a bike shop once and the guy who owned the shop used to build his own frames. And when he got out of that and he got just into, you know, buying and selling bikes, anytime he was selling bikes to a couple, he would always sell the nicer, more expensive bike to the cyclist who biked a lot less. Knowing that if you have two people and one of them is kind of new to cycling, but gets on a bike that really feels good and fits them and they like using, they'll get out a lot. They'll motivate that person, you know, who bikes a bunch anyway to kind of level up in significant ways. So it was pretty cool to see like couples go home and, you know, sometimes one of them would have a way nicer bike and then they'd come back in a couple months because, you know, the partner was like, oh, wait a minute. Now I need a nice bike because I can't keep up because I can't compete. So cool sales tactic. <laughs> OK, so let's talk about size. How do you know if a bike fits you? If you go into shop, they'll usually give you kind of a, a basic sense of the size you need. They'll put you on some bikes. They'll tell you what looks like it fits well. But if you decide to buy a used bike online, you definitely need to know about how to size a bike. So let's look at this gal on the left. This bike is way too small. And I know this is a cartoon, but the thing that you look at is the space between the top tube of the bicycle. Now we know that lingo. Um, and basically, you know, where her body is, where her like crotch is, because you want to have enough space between you and the bike that you can easily without landing on the top tube. But you don't want to have a ton of space because everything is sized, you know, relative. If you don't have a long seat tube, you also won't have a tube. everything else is going to be small. So let's look at the bike that's too big. Um, looking at that same place between the top tube and this woman's body, if she dismounted this bike, she would land on the top tube. If anyone's done that, super uncomfy. So the ideal size is going to be a bike where if you stand over it and you lift it up, you've got about two inches between your body and the top tube. Obviously, that's going to change based on the style of the bike. This is kind of a classic road bike style if you have a step through frame the sizing won't be as easy to estimate as that. You won't have that like two inches of space. You might see, you know, five to even 10 inches of space if you have a like beach cruiser bike. But this is a good place to begin thinking about size. So the bike usually will have the size listed on the seat tube. You also can often ask, you know, at the bike shop or that individual who's maybe selling the used bike online what size it is. If someone just says it's a medium sized bike, that's not enough info. Medium can be a huge range. 
So what you want to know is the standover height. And that is basically the distance between, well, it's basically when you stand over the bike, how much space you have and how kind of the length of your legs matches up with the top tube length, more or less. So this is what I'm talking about. And I want to complain a little bit because having been a bike mechanic since I was like 18, sometimes I'll call up bike shops because I'm like, you know, visiting a new city. I want to rent a bike. And I'll tell them, like, this is the size bike I need. And they'll say, okay, but how tall are you? And I'll tell them I'm 5'5". Five, five, and they'll be like, oh, I'm going to put you on a small bike. I've got long legs. I don't have leg, like, leg length relative to my height. It's not the, you know, the, like, expected proportions. With that said, I've got a buddy who's six feet tall. He's the same length legs as me. So if we call up a bike shop and say we need bikes and they ask about our height, they would give us completely different size bikes when in fact we fit on the same size bike because we have the same length legs. So when you go pants shopping, inseam length is something that a lot of people do know. They just don't think about that often. So if you look at the bottom, you've got your height and then the inseam length and then the suggested size of bike. You can basically go online and Google what size bike should I fit on? What size bike do I fit on? You'll see both these numbers. If you know your inseam length, that's what you want to focus on, not the height. Unless you know that you have like a really well-proportioned body. Maybe you do, but that's why this is all about fitting bikes to people's unique bodies. So step two of basic bike fitting is the saddle height and position. So we have two excellent examples. This is my buddy John on the left. He's got his knee bent. We'll talk about that. Um, and then this gal you can see has her leg extended. So different positions of the pedal stroke and two things to look at. When you get to the bottom of the pedal stroke, your leg should almost be at full extension. If anybody's, you know, biked up hills with the seat way low and you've gotten that like burning feeling in both thighs, that's because the seat's too low. And I know that a lot of people feel confident being able to stop the bike, put both feet down flat and stand stable. So I have a video, which I'm not gonna show today, but it's on the Bike Coalition's YouTube channel. And it's all about how to start and stop a bike in what we call the pedal ready position. That's a really useful thing to know about because that's gonna allow you to get off of the saddle anytime you stop and then kind of launch off with a little bit of momentum and then get your bum back on the saddle. That movement, getting all the way off the saddle and then all the way back on each time you stop the bike might take a little while to get used to, but it's a great technique. It's going to keep you a lot more stable and safe when you stop biking, and it's going to give you a lot more momentum to use when you take off again. So she's got her seat up at the right height. Fantastic. If she stops, she might not be able to stand, except maybe on tiptoes. She'd have to dismount the bike. So let's check out John. What we want to look at when he's got his pedals at just about, you know, kind of uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock is the how well his patella, his knee bone lines up with the ball of his foot. Ideally, in that position, when you're about to be pushing down with most of your power, you want your knee exactly above the ball of the foot and the ball of the foot should be over the axle of the pedal. So the middle the midpoint of the pedal. So a couple things just to think about you know, right now with the bike you've got at home, is the seat high enough? And is your body positioned so that anytime you push down, this is what's happening. Let's talk about shoes a little bit. So you got options. Some people like to have a shoe that they clip into. Some people like to use toe cages, which I just popped up. Some people like platform pedals, pretty common with mountain biking, having a pedal you can just step on and step off again. Toe cage is kind of going out of style, actually. And then this is called a clipless pedal. A lot of people want to call these clips. Fun fact, the clipless pedal name came out of back when ski bindings used to be a, well, ski bindings haven't changed much. Ski binding was made, and then the clipless pedal was a copy of that. But the ski binding was called a clip, and so they want to distinguish. They called it a clipless pedal. Totally confusing, but... The one that you clip into is a clipless pedal. It has a cleat that attaches to your shoe. You can put shims in and adjust the shoe in lots of ways. You can move the cleat up and back. You can adjust the tension on the clip itself so that it'll snap off easily. 
So that's something people often use if they want to just get a little bit more power be behind each pedal stroke. What I like about a clipless pedal is that your foot has to be in the right place. As long as you line up the cleat in the place it needs to be, anytime you get on that pedal, you'll be pushing down exactly in the place that you need to. So you don't end up doing a lot of knee, you know, leg, ankle, foot damage by pushing in the wrong place. A little anecdote, I was just teaching someone how to bike who is totally new to cycling. She had platform pedals and she kept getting on the bike and saying, why when I push down am I going backwards? And it was because she had her heel over the axle of the pedal. And so when she was pushing, she was, you know, pushing back. So we talked about it. She switched to some nice stiff soled shoes. She moved her foot position so that instead the ball of her foot was on the axle of the pedal. She hasn't done that like accidental push backwards thing since then. Okay, next thing about fitting. This is about both the handlebar height and the reach and how this is gonna affect, um, basically this is the place people complain about the most pain. This is gonna affect wrist pain, hand pain, elbow pain, back pain, low back pain, neck pain, all of it if this isn't adjusted well. So check out my mate Johnny biking in New Zealand. Two angles to look at is his elbow angle about 150 degrees. And this is gonna depend on the style of bike you have. But if you have anything between a you know touring road bike, even a mountain bike, this is kind of the ideal position you wanna be in. Um, and then the next angle I'm looking at is his body and his arm. We'd also think about his hip angle a little bit, but that's not what this section's about. So I made a little demo photo. This is me way too extended on a bike. You can see my elbows locked off. You can see this angle is really wide. That's gonna kill my neck, my back, my elbows, my wrists, all of it. Now we got this guy on the right, funny old school photo. So totally fine to ride bikes like this. It's just gonna be a completely different feel. And this will be nice to go a couple miles in, but going 10, 15 miles on a bike that's this upright is gonna just use a totally different set of muscles. And let's actually do that. So this is kind of a fun activity. So if you want, just like scooch back and join me. Taking a look in the chat. Oh, thanks. I got a, I got a comment. Thanks folks. Oh, feel free to comment also. I'm, I'm watching. I wanna know what you have to say. Okay, so this is the activity. Hopefully you can kind of see me. Basically you wanna sit on the edge of a seat and then you wanna stand up without thinking about it too much. What's gonna happen when you stand is that you might bend just a little bit at the hips. So do it a couple times. And again, like don't think about it too much, just see like how do you want to move when you stand up. So now this is the challenge. Can you stand without bending at all? Because I imagine a lot of you did kind of lean to get almost you know momentum to get you going, but you might've also noticed that when you lean a little bit, it activates totally different muscles. And you'd feel that also if you sit on the edge of the seat and you like lift both knees up one at a time, that's gonna use a lot of ab muscle. So that's this pedaling position, it takes a ton more muscle than being in this position. So now this is the challenge again, is just to stand up, you know, elevate without bending at all. And I can do it with my like kind of swing and get into it. And I've also done this a bunch of times, but it is not as easy. It takes a totally different set of muscles to do that. The way that we've, you know, been designed as human bodies is to bend. So that bend that you get into when you stand up just off the seat is pretty close to the same position you'd want to be in on a bicycle. At the top, you'll see this image of a couple of, you know, kind of acceptable body positions to be in. So each of these positions will come back to you in a moment because the place you sit on the saddle, how you hold the bike and how you use the muscles you've got is gonna change based on these positions. Okay, so last component of fitting things you might wanna be thinking about and adjusting is the handlebar angle. So you can see both a road bike handlebar on the right and then kind of a mountain bike style flat bar on the left. So noticing on the left in photo three, if you will, this individual's wrist is totally straight, extending out to the hands. When they pull, they just pull back like this. Dun, dun. Um, same kind of thing you can see in the, the good example on the road bike, just like nice straight alignment. So 
Now you've got a couple of bad examples. This is the places that you might notice hand pain, numbness and tingling, wrist pain. It might even extend, you know, up and kind of radiate beyond that. But anytime you bend your wrist and then you put weight on it as you bike, you'll be cutting off blood flow. Seems pretty obvious, but little adjustments, just like moving the brake lever down a little bit, changing the angle of the road brake levers, you know, tilting them in just a little bit up, down, all of those little adjustments can go a long, long way. You just need to know about them. So why is bike fit such a big deal? I mean, a piece of it is just that it's nice to, you know, it's nice to be able to fully enjoy biking and be on a bike that feels good. But I also think that it helps people gain confidence when they bike, because if you feel like the bike fits you, if you feel good when you get on it, you'll have more confidence. The components of, you know, the bike lingo that we've just done, that can be a huge confidence boost when it comes to going into bike shops and talking about what you need. Again, just comfort on the bike is a pretty key thing. But also having a bike that fits you makes you way more able to control that bike. I had a guy come into my shop once who was about my height, like five foot five. He was on like an XL mountain bike. He couldn't get on and off that thing without tilting the whole bike to the side and stepping down. He even had like big shoes on just to be able to stand, you know, safely on the bike. And I told him the bike was too big. It was something that someone had given him. It was a handy down. It meant a lot to him. He kept it. But I watched him bike away on it and it was Oh my gosh, it was like frightening to see this guy like get on this bike and know that he couldn't safely get off of it easily at a stop sign. He was so extended that he looked unbalanced. He didn't have his weight in the places that it needed to be, so he just couldn't fully control the bike the way he needed to. So this is it. Let's do some bike fitting at home because a lot of adjustments you can do with kind of the basic tools you might have anyway. I've got that tool. This is the Crank Bros M17 multi-tool. I think it's one of the best multi-tools. I don't get paid by this company. I actually just love what they do. This has a lifetime warranty. So if you damage this tool, and I have, they just send you a new one. This is my new one. So it comes with tons of useful stuff, all the most common things you need to affix almost any bike. But basically, most saddles, it's just simply a hex key, an Allen, if you will, that's going to make a lot of adjustments in the saddle. Up, back, down, we'll talk about all of that. Um, some old bikes instead will have a nut, as you can see highlighted on this saddle, and then you might need an adjustable wrench or the actual like size wrench that fits on it. Usually it's a 14 mil. Okay, saddles. I am going to give you all an anecdote again, but feel free to write in the chat what kind of saddle you have because I want to know. I want to know what you choose. People always want advice about saddles. So I used to be a bike mechanic, and then I got into fixing my own bike maintenance classes, and it was mostly because of one woman who came to my shop so many times because she had lots of little bike things that she needed fixed, and I think she felt like she could talk to me in a way that she couldn't talk to a lot of the mechanics she'd met. And the thing that she wanted to talk to me about most was saddles. And, you know, it's like... It's people's bodies. It's an intimate space on people's bodies that the saddle is touching. And so to be able to talk to someone, you know, who you kind of can identify with is really helpful when it comes to actually getting the, the knowledge you need to choose the saddle that you need. So a saddle shouldn't be uncomfy. She had stopped biking because the saddle was uncomfy. She'd gotten a new bike. It still didn't feel good. And she was like, I know I want to be doing this. I just don't know how to get back into biking when anytime I sit down in the saddle, my body aches. And she was more specific with me, which was really helpful. So we were able to find the kind of saddle that she needed. But you can see a couple of examples. Some of these saddles have cutouts. Um, some have a really like stiff, you know, solid, um, what do we want to call it? Just a solid build. They don't have like cushioning and gel and all that soft stuff. Some of them have different shape noses. You can see um, on this one, I assume that's like a carbon fiber saddle really long and narrow. You'll see the space in the back, you know, the width is going to change quite a bit. Oh, cool. Kevin, Kevin has, I bet he's got a vintage brick saddle based on what he's explaining. I've had a lot of people look at my bike saddle and be like, Oh, I bet that sucks to sit on, but it fits my body. And I'll show you how to do a little saddle fitting in a second. 
Okay, so ideally, the saddle is going to be supporting you by your sit bones. So that's the two bones in the pelvis. If you like, you know, sit on both hands, you'll, you should immediately feel them. It's the two like pokiest butt bones. When I was a little kid, I was always told I had a bony butt and I wasn't allowed to sit on people's laps. But then I got into biking and I don't have bony a bad butt. <laughs> so this is what I was talking about a minute ago was looking at how the angle that you sit at is going to change lots of things about how you feel on the bike. So it's going to change hip angle, obviously, but the place that your body is touching the saddle is going to change too. And so picking a saddle that's going to go along with the way that you plan to bike is a big deal. Oh, excellent. Someone else has a comment about saddles. They've got a stock saddle came with the bike and that's pretty common people will just like take the saddle that came with the bike and then they'll make some adjustments to go along with it sometimes that saddle is all you need sometimes you get on that saddle and you go a mile and that's the end of it you don't want to bike again definitely choosing clothing is essential and we'll talk about that soon too so excellent Okay, so we talked a little bit about the way that you sit on the saddle and how as you change positions, the place you have the most weight and pressure is going to shift. The biggest issue with a saddle being uncomfy is usually that it's squishing on tissue. If it's not holding you by the sit bones, but instead it's putting pressure someplace else, again, it's cutting off blood flow. So much about bike fitting is about having you in a position that you'll have like good circulation the whole time. So sometimes having a cushy saddle isn't what you need. Sometimes having too soft a saddle will feel good for a couple miles, but again, it'll cut off blood flow and it'll make you, you know, numb and achy and all of those things. That's one thing I love with cutouts is that, you know, the basically like kind of the perineum place in the body. If you have a cutout in the saddle, you have no contact with that space. So men like cutout saddles, women like cutout saddles, all kinds of people like cutouts in saddles. Often that's not what a stock saddle has. Um, thigh chafing, this comes up a lot, is it's not that I'm having like pain in, you know, in my butt, in my perineum, someplace else, but it's that my thighs actually ache when I'm pedaling. So that's going to be about how wide the saddle is and how quickly it kind of like tapers off. So take a look at this one. You'll see how narrow it gets really close to the back of the saddle. So this is my buddy Kalei. She and I did a bike, um, a long distance kind of bike packing class. And one way that you can do a little bike fitting at home is with Play-Doh. So she put this Play-Doh in plastic. She actually made homemade Play-Doh, totally simple to make. You can do it with a lot of like, you know, flexible soft things that'll mold, but put the plastic on the Play-Doh, you sit on it, lift both knees up just a little bit you'll get this indent that is like the shape of your butt. You can also do this like sitting on the edge of a pool. If you like jump in, jump back out, you sit down, you'll kind of get a sense of like your body shape based on the imprint that it makes. But what you want to look at is the distance between both sit bones. So like the pointiest, deepest point in that Play-Doh. And then you need to do a little bit of a calculation. I honestly can't remember what exactly it is. I think it's something like you add, you know, three inches total, something like that. And that'll tell you how wide a saddle you need. But you can Google that. You can Google how to do a saddle fitting at home. You can find out what size saddle you need. It's going to be the, the width at the back of the saddle. And that'll be a good place to begin. So simple saddle adjustments. Again, stuff you can do at home. The saddle moves up and back. Whoa! A lot of people don't know that. You can move it way up and way back. It does have a place that it, you know, kind of a limit for how much you should move it up and back. And the way that you move it up and back is going to change your knee relative to foot position. We talked about that a couple slides ago. When you push down with your knee, it should be lined up exactly with the ball of your foot and the axle of the pedal. So if you move the saddle up or back way too much, it's going to change that angle. That could cause knee pain hip pain, ankle pain, foot pain, all those like low body places. The saddle also can tilt up and down. This was life changing when I found this out. So if you have a saddle that is like way, way, way too tilted up, you'll know that's gonna not feel so good. 
And if you have it way too tilted down, you might constantly be like sliding off the paddle, the, the saddle. And this is one of those places again, that like people's unique anatomy is gonna make a big difference in how you angle the saddle. So typically, can y'all see this bike behind me? Typically you'll angle, you'll have the nose kind of pointed about at the top of the stem, the handlebars. I did have a bike that had a saddle that wasn't great. And I noticed that if I tilted the saddle down just a little bit below that point, that actually felt good on my body. And this is something that's gonna change, you know, between the saddles you have, between the bikes you have, the way that you bike on them. So talking about bike fit and saddle height. This is just a little like mini lesson. And that is with all these things we've talked about, you should only be adjusting one thing at a time. You might know that the bike you have has a ton of things that need to get changed, but if you change all of it at once, you don't know what is solving the issue, but you also won't be able to, um, you know, just like really get a sense of exactly how much of an adjustment you need. So also make small changes. If you decide that the saddle has been too low, don't just boost it up, you know, six inches and get back on. Cause then you have to develop a whole new set of skills, like getting on and off that bike when you stop, you know, how you pedal is going to change significantly. So make little adjustments, do them one at a time. And also people's bodies will continue to change. It's not so much about age. It's about like the way that you bike, the way you bike is going to change. If you bike long distances, if you switch up bikes, all of that's going to change. All the things about the bike fit might change as well. Okay. This is why most people want to talk about bike fitting is because they do have pain. They do have discomfort. And a lot of people just put up with it and you don't have to. This is a lot of what Nelson was talking about. This is some of the stuff that I really loved in his video. He was talking about doing things like yoga and calisthenics. He was talking about drinking and not sipping. He was talking about his choices of what he's gonna eat each day and how that's gonna affect how he feels on the bike, what kind of distances he can go. And then fitting, that's what we've been talking about is like getting the bike dialed in so that it feels good. So this is a slide, I would almost suggest just like taking a screenshot now Although this is on YouTube, you can go back and watch it anytime. I'm not going to talk about each one of these, but this is something you can find on the um, bikefitting.com website. Amazing, amazing resource. And they just list out piece by piece. Like if you have hand numbness, this is some of the things you might want to think about. Maybe lift the handlebars up, maybe move the saddle up. But again, the saddle placement is going to affect knee stuff as well. Maybe change the angle of the saddle, maybe change the angle of the handlebars. All of those things will affect how much weight you have on both hands and on and on. So low body stuff, same thing, pain in the Achilles. Maybe you want to move your foot forward. If you have a cleat, a clipless pedal, maybe you want to move the cleat back a little bit. Again, feel free to take a screenshot, come back and watch this again. Check out bikefitting.com because they have tons and tons and tons of useful info about the pain you feel and how to solve it, but just do one thing at a time. So a lot of people don't know this, but you can get a professional bike fit done. Should you do that? It depends on what kind of biking you want to do. It also depends, you know, what you feel capable of doing at home. So maybe watching this video will be enough. You'll move the saddle up a couple inches and you'll be like, oh my gosh, that's it. I don't feel pain in my thighs and my knees. Okay. I get it. I'm good. If you want to be biking, long distances, you know, bike racing, anything kind of more intense than just the casual, like a couple miles, a couple times a week, you might want to go in and get a bike fit. It's usually a lot of fun. Usually they'll set you up with like tons of different saddles and they'll change the length of the stem. Sometimes they have these automatic bike fitting machines. You just sit on it. They push a little button and like things adjust all around you. One thing to know about bike fitting is that the bike fit you get now might not last a lifetime. You might get a bike fit. It changes how the bike feels significantly. You want to be biking twice as much as you used to. And then you get flexibility in new places. You get stiffness in new places. You need a new fit eventually. So it doesn't last a lifetime. So Nelson also talked a little bit about kind of clothing and some of the additional components that will like add to comfort when you bike. We also had someone in the chat who was suggesting uh, having, you know, padded like chamois pads. So they make 
pretty cool bike clothing now. I know it doesn't look cool when you can see the pad, but they actually make some cool like women's undies that come with a small pad built in like this. Uh, you can get awesome stuff at She Beast. She Beast is a company that makes women's specific clothing. Bike bibs. I really love biking in bibs. I don't like the feeling of like the tight spandex on my waist. So the bib is the spandex that goes all the way up. It's like a one piece. I know it looks a little bit silly. Maybe you think it looks a little bit cool, but that's a nice feeling to not have like a tight spandex waistband. Sometimes gloves can be a huge thing to help with hand pain, just having a little bit of padding. And then you gotta have stiff soled shoes. If you have like flip flops, soft shoes, you end up pushing with like toes and like little bits of the foot, not the whole foot. Again, some of the stuff that Nelson was talking about that I really value is that it's what you do on and off the bike that's significant. So if you have done a bunch of fitting things and you still don't feel good when you bike any more than 10 miles, this is some stuff to think about. So do you have a good cadence? You should be pedaling at about 70 to 90 revolutions a minute. So each second, you should just about be like going all the way around the pedals which means you got to shift a ton. It means that when you go up hills, you got to shift down a whole bunch so you can stay at this, you know, kind of cadence. And when you even bike on flats, like instead of just putting a lot of muscle behind pedaling, shift so you can pedal fast. So that's one thing. Also, I love this. This was a, a Nelson Vales quote that I'm going to use again. Well, actually, he had a couple of quotes that I love. You've got to build up to those big mile rides. Okay, it's not an exact quote, but it's basically what he was talking about. Just because you got a bike fit doesn't mean it's time to get on and bike, you know, 50, 60 miles at a time. Like, begin with 10, build up to 20, you know, on a weekend, maybe go 40. But make sure that with all of that, you take everything else about the body systems into account. So stretching before and after you ride, maybe fitting in some yoga if you stop to get lunch, like, again, do a little bit to loosen up. I have such tight hips because of cycling and I don't do enough yoga to help balance that out. So that's something in my life that I need to be conscious of. I know that the way that I'm biking is only using, you know, a couple of muscles and it's only building flexibility in a couple of places in my body. And it's just not enough to like sustain a healthy lifestyle. Also, you know, think about ways that you can build muscles again and flexibility in new places to support the kind of cycling that you want to do. A couple months ago, I was getting a lot of back pain because of the way that I was lifting things. I noticed I would get on the bike and I would feel that back pain again. So I began doing some like light weight lifting to build muscles in my back. And now, you know, on the bike, off the bike, I don't have that pain. Hey, we made it to the end and just on time. So thank you all so much. A couple things that I wanted to just let you know about. We have tons of classes that we teach at the Bike Coalition. Bike fitting is just one of them. We've done bike painting. We've done biking with kids. We've got a city cycling class. We just want to make this info as accessible as possible because biking isn't as easy as just getting a bike and going. It takes a little bit to get the confidence and skills you need to get out and do this and then make it a lifestyle. Also, this is the end of bike month. May is bike month. We've been doing this bike month challenge all month long. It's coming to a close, but you can still win a couple of things. One of those things you can win is a recovery bundle by CV Sciences. That's the same company that was talking to Nelson Bales at the beginning of this video. Also, New Belgium Bicycle is giving away a one-of-a-kind 2021 model Brooklyn bicycle. That's really cool as well. So both of those challenges will come to a halt this weekend. So head to love to ride.net backslash San Diego County. You'll find out how to win the CV sciences recovery bundles and possibly a new Belgian bicycle just by doing some pedaling. Cool. Well, thank you all again. And I hope you got something useful out of this. You can always go back and watch it again. And the bike coalition, we like chatting with folks. So send us an email, you know, find us on social media. Let's talk about bike fitting. Peace.